Hello everyone, how are you? I'm Ari Ferger and today I'm going to talk about Horskonk, the divination process to catch a glimpse of what's coming next year. I thought it would be a fitting subject for a video for the last days of December, since this is indeed a divination method from Swedish folk traditions that was and still is practiced just before Christmas or at New Year's Eve precisely to find out what the upcoming new year has to offer. So, we still have time and after the information in this video perhaps you can go out there and uh, try it for yourself. I'm also doing this video because this folk tradition, Orskong, bears close similarities with the Scandinavian semi-shamanic practice of Uti Seta or Sitya Uti. Uh, which I've talked about on a previous video, uh, which you can see right here. If you have the time, of course, just click in this information icon in this right upper corner and you can go and watch that video. Um, I don't want to repeat myself, obviously, for your own sake, but perhaps it will be necessary to remind you just a little bit about the process of Uti Seta, uh, sitting outside for divination purposes to acquire knowledge and secret wisdom from supernatural entities. Don't worry, I won't take half an hour to explain it all again, but just a quick and general panorama so you can remember and interiorize the key points of Uti Seta, because indeed it has a lot of similarities and we see in this pre-Christian Scandinavian practice of Uti Seta a lot of elements that have survived and to a certain extent these elements are still perceptible in the Swedish folk tradition of Orskong. So, as you know it, there are several divination methods, some of which involve the contact with supernatural entities or contact with the dead, the deceased, the departed, usually contact with the ancestors. In ancient societies, the corpse, through a variety of methods, including sacrifice and even augury uh, divination through uh, body parts, uh, the corpse became a symbol of the highest degree of exchange between the living and the divine. The corpse was regarded as the vessel in between which allowed the living to have contact with the supernatural and uh, receive prophecy from the dead. Since we are talking about Scandinavian uh, historical contexts, we see this all over the pre-Christian Sc Scandinavian cultural world. Uh, remember the very famous poem Voluspo, in which Odin wakes up a dead Cirrus and from her he received knowledge from the past, the present and the future. He received prophecy. It is, after all, the prophecy of the Cirrus, of the prophetess, of the Volva. The connection with deceased ancestors remained firm in the ancient world. The familial bonds transcended death. And I have no doubt that there existed a strong cult of the dead in ancient times, as we find plenty of evidences for, for that, precisely, in several archaeological contexts. The dead were seen as exceptionally wise because they had both the knowledge of this world, of the living, and the, and the, and the knowledge of the other world. And since pagan society still held on to particularly strong animistic notions, the corpse wasn't merely regarded as an inanimate thing, but still with a certain level of animation, still possible to contact with, and hidden knowledge could still be obtained from the dead, of course, particularly the recent dead. So, the dead, the deceased, the, the departed, were often consulted in times of difficulty by family members, as evidenced by the practice of sitting on a burial mound, precisely to communicate with the dead ancestors. In pre-Christian Scandinavia, the custom of sitting on a burial mound to acquire wisdom from the departed is closely related to the practice of Uti Seta, sitting out, sitting outside. Uti Seta refers to the act of an individual seeking solitude in wild and inhospitable places, beyond the boundaries that 
divide the civilized world of the living from the uncivilized, the untamed, the wilderness, which was considered uh, the world where supernatural entities inhabited, some of which the most dangerous of them all, and the deceased as well, the dead. The origins of this practice seems to have been performed at night, beyond the edge of the wild places of the world, but with the advent of Christianity and the prohibition of certain pagan practices, including sitting on burial mounds, people would continue to practice Utiseta, sitting outside, but in old places away from the boundaries of Christendom. A practice on liminal places, such as the old burial mounds, abandoned and left far away from the settlements, on graveyards as well, or crossroads, as being the places perceived to be the grounds and paths where the dead roam or inhabit. So these places continue to be visited in the practice of Uti Seta, so people could seek and receive counsel from the dead. During these periods of sitting out, it is said that through a variety of ritual techniques or even through meditation, one would either summon the deceased uh, to the place or meet the dead in a different place, sometimes in an altered form such as a bird or another animal, and as such receive divination from such entities. These practices included the chanting of spell songs or charms, poems and magical incantations, especially under the cover of an animal hide or a heavy cloak. And precisely one of the best descriptions of the practice of sitting outside Utiseta comes from a modern Icelandic folk tradition which gives us a couple of clues on what the pre-Christian Old Norse practice of Sitya Uti would be about and the purpose of such a practice. So, the Icelandic modern practice of Utiseta, and when I mean modern, I mean post-medieval period, uh, early modern period, already during the Catholic period of Iceland. So, the practice of Utiseta, apparently, it must take place on a New Year's night at a crossroads, where the roads lead to four churches. One must be equipped with a grey cat, a grey sheep skin, the skin of a walrus or an old bull or an old ox, and an axe. One is supposed to cover oneself with the skin so that no body part remains uncovered and to hold the axe and focus on its blade without looking away. Then one can start chanting magical formulas in order to summon the dead and then the, the kinsmen of the person who are buried by some of the four churches uh, come uh, to the person and answer well, everything the person asks them uh, both about the past and the future. The person received hidden knowledge and prophecy. Even though the Old Norse practice of Sitya Uti seems to deal a lot more with the contact of um, supernatural entities of other worlds or other spheres of reality, and uh, not just the dead or the, 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 the ancestors, but also other entities, the evolution of the practice in Iceland, Uti Seta, deals a lot more with the contact with the dead. With the advent of Christianity and forbidding people from having contact with the old places and the wilderness, as well as heathen practices in general, punishable by death by now, by this period. The practice of sitting outside changes a lot, but certain key elements remain, which are seeking solitude, so it's a solitary practice, seeking out a place that marks the limit between the civilized and the wild, or rather a place outside the boundaries of the relative safety of the world of the living. The practice started to take place on New Year's Eve or the very New Year's night. Also a practice in darkness during the night under the concealment of the dark and summoning the dead with spell songs, uh, charms or magical incantations and not just any dead, but the ancestors, 
people close to the person. And this last point is uh, particularly interesting, but I shall explore that on a future video about how the ancestors are regarded in animistic societies, uh, because it's important to know who the deceased person is, knowing the name and even have familiarity with the deceased in order to call upon the deceased a clear familial bond, but more on that later. Anyway, I think you got the main idea of Utiseta, sitting outside, sitting out. No point in repeating myself. For more information, uh, check the video I have recommended earlier. Um, I'll put it uh, on the description of this video as well. So, now let's explore the practice of Orskong. Finally, please. As said before, there are many divination methods, some of which can be used several times uh, throughout <laughs> the entire year. But there is one method, or rather a practice, which usually gets you covered for the entire year, and that is Orskong, the yearly walk or the year walk. And the purpose is to acquire yearly prophecy. <laughs> it's a practice not that common these days, uh, but it used to be quite common actually uh, in olden days. So this is the major divination practice to cover the whole year. Uh, it typically involves seeking knowledge concerning health, uh, love, uh, to predict who will die in, the, in this upcoming year, also concerning economic issues, who is going to be married, <laughs> Uh, to reveal future misfortunes or luck and general success. So it's to gain knowledge about various aspects of life we are usually concerned about, prophecy about future events throughout the entire year, this new year to come, which is why this is a divination practice um, done either during Christmas or at New Year's Eve or at New Year's night. And in some cases, actually, it has also been recorded doing this precisely at the New Year's Day, a great way to start the new year, the very first day of the year, uh, if the prophecy is favorable, of course. As was said, this method or this practice is called Orskong, the year walk. It is generally done by walking around the home or within the perimeter of your home and be attentive to meanings that occur along the way. And this is what we must address before going any further. This idea of seeking out meanings. Orsgong is one of the practices we can place in the category of spodom, spodoma, <laughs> which is divination, precisely. Within spodom, there are several methods to acquire prophecy and one of which is Orskong. But there is no prophecy without meaning, obviously, and meaning is Tidor. Tidor is what one must seek. Now, a Tida is something that can be perceived. It is meaning. It is interpretation of what is perceived or seen. That's one of the most important components in any work of magic, which is understanding through perceived meaning. We observe, we study, we gather information, we gather Tidor. Every information we absorb through our senses, we will filter it, we will ponder about it, meditate, reflect, various processes in the development of what has been perceived, and finally we get to the meaning or a meaning. Tida is not just a meaning, but it is a creative force because it is with understanding of a meaning that we create an effect so it can affect, right? This is why it is so important, the solitude and silence, absolute silence, in several methods of divination, including Orskong. So we can focus on what is observed and understand its meaning without having any other distractions, without speaking any words to anyone or ourselves because it can and will affect Tida, it will affect interpretation, meaning, because we are not dealing with an inanimate thing, but with creative forces, active all around and each bear meaning. So it's very important to understand that. You take 
meaning from events, from experiences, both inner and outer experiences. And in Oshgong, we must be attentive to the outer experiences, not the inner ones. Uh, the omens and the signs, the things that can be heard and seen or even felt to a certain extent, which by themselves convey meaning. I know this might be a little bit silly and you might think that my talk is all cryptic and such, but know that in all honesty, I'm really trying to pass on to you a type of perception that can only be lived by the individual. I'm trying to express a creative force that cannot simply be understood through words, but rather felt and lived. This is very much like trying to explain a dream to someone else. You are the only one who lived that dream, you have experienced it, you know each detail, and no matter how many words you use to describe it uh, to someone, someone else, uh, that person will never have the same feelings and the same perception and truly understand your dream because the person did not experience it. So the person will only be able to create certain images from your own words, but under the perception and experience that person possesses, according to the knowledge uh, that person has. So, indeed, the meaning you seek in divination is something quite unique that will only be perceptible if you experience this, if you live this. So, this is what happens in Orshkong. While out there, you take Tidor, you take perception, meaning, explanation from outer experiences or anything that occurs in your way. Odd visions, movements of shadows or strange shadows, hearing sounds, in other words, shapes, appearances and events perceivable with the outer senses. Many things you shall meet on the road and such, such things have their own specific behavior in that moment not to mention the, the shape of things and color, movement, uh, specific shapes of, of plants, parts of an animal carcass along the way, the way birds fly, the sounds of your surroundings and the part particular feeling in your body or part of your body, a particular pain or itching or some heaviness at a particular moment in a specific part of your body. So from this walk, you make alone at night, you will get meaning because everything has a behavior, action. It is animated and you are interacting with it and it will interact with you. Orshgong is not the interpretation of dreams or visions and hallucinations. It is not the interpretation of inner experiences. Orshgong is the interpretation of the outer experiences, the outer Tidor. The, the exterior perceptible meaning. And that's what uh, is important to take in mind. To understand your place and the exterior things interacting with you in that place while you make the yearly walk, Orskong. It is as simple and as complex as that. <laughs> now, as said before, Orskong also bears close parallels with the practice of Uti Seta or sitting out. The practice alone can be done around the house or in the vicinity and the observance of the events around the house and the, the people near it give many clues, obviously, many perceptible meanings. However, Orshgong can also be performed by going outside, further away from the home, from the familiar places, even beyond the boundary of the human world and uh, stepping into the wilds. A solitary walk at night under the cover of darkness without distractions from unwanted sounds and events. This highly depends on the purpose and meaning you seek, obviously. Uh, if divination is concerning you, your own person and the people around you, your familiar and private life, you will want to seek the meanings in those familiar environments. However, if you seek meaning or if you seek something else, you must go further away from the familiar, from the safety and comfort of home. 
a night walk in the woods is I think a great method to train your mind not only to be more receptive to the creative powers existing in the world but also the fact that you are all alone in the dark it causes an easiness, fear, anxiety and a whole set of emotions that clouds your mind and prevents you from achieving perceptible meaning. So that's perhaps the hardest but also the best way to of finding out meaning, to find what in English you would call omens and signs. Seeing past your inner experiences, that's the, the whole train. <laughs> you, you see past the inner tidor, the inner meaning transmitted by what you feel and instead concentrate on the outer tidor, the outer experiences and, and meanings that come from such exterior experiences the exterior creative powers. Not an easy process in the slightest, I must admit. And not surprising, it is often said that performing the divination process of Orchgong for seven or nine years in a row will grant the practitioner several gifts. Even if you do not believe in such things, no doubt that you will progressively get used to the experience and start to notice things that you could not notice before because of the inner emotions felt in such lonely places in, in the dark wilds. Of course, nowadays it is a little bit difficult to practice Orchgong and, and go far enough uh, that you can't even hear any person or a car or even a damnable metal bird, an airplane. <laughs> in the village I grew up in, um, this wasn't difficult at all. I literally just had to go into the backyard, with, which wasn't the backyard, it was the wilds already. And I was in the forest with wolves and wild boars roaming the place. Not very safe either. Still, the practice of Orchgong uh, in the wild places of the world is usually at night, alone, in silence. In fact, the idea here is actually spending the entire day avoiding eating anything or even drinking, not socializing with anyone, complete silence and you tell no one where you go. Because again, the idea is preventing things from influencing Tidor. Uh, you don't want the Tida from the wilds, the meaning <laughs> uh, being altered and uh, influenced by other meanings, by other creative powers or creative forces, by people and sounds that create alternative meanings in this sort of living web of creative powers. You don't want distractions at all. You don't want a bird to fly away in a specific manner because someone else decided to show up or to shout and that meaning from that person influenced the other meaning. The purpose is to be completely alone and let yourself be immersed in the surroundings and be attentive to how each meaning behaves towards you and your presence in there. The purpose here is to set up a course for yourself, go for a walk and eventually return home without being led astray from your path due to whatever entities are out there to take you away. <laughs> Let me explain. There are rules to be followed you set up a course which involves getting out of your home, passing through places that symbolically represent a boundary, such as a forest, and the final destination is a place where the dead reside, the kinsmen, the ancestors. Could be the church, or a graveyard, or a crossroads, or the road which was used to transport the dead and in the end, return home. The idea of the dead in here mainly represents familiarity with someone who stands in between. And at a certain occasion, certain occasions throughout the year, the dead wander about again. But this also has to do with muck, with power. Muck, which is might or power, which resides in all things, uh, somewhat like the old Norse concept of Megin. Everything contains power and leaves, leaves traces of power. 
and the strong emotions caused by death leave traces of power that can be harnessed to perceive meaning. Which is why, in this case, in this performance similar to Uti Seta, places such as crossroads, old graveyards, cemeteries, which are often built on top of sacred pagan sites and also burial mounds and such, are precisely the places sought for these types of divination purposes, uh, these divination processes, uh, because these are places that contain power and usually the power of the deceased, of the human dead, because these are the ones more familiar to us, with whom there is close proximity and understanding, a better com communication with, because they have once been like us and we shall be like them. You will better understand what I'm saying uh, in here <laughs> when I do the video about ancestors in animism. Still, the idea is to cross boundaries and seek places of power. A solitary and silent walk in darkness during the night, transporting us to the old grave mounds, ancient megalithic stone structures, crossroads, earthbound rocks, wells, streams, waterfalls, places that hold power and therefore that power can be observed which will give us a perceptible meaning. Because this power, muck, causes influence and affects the atmosphere, creating behavior, creating effects that will give us meaning. Tidor. Seeking out the various meanings uh, in, on this yearly walk is important to perceive behavior and influence, to perceive muck and tida, to perceive power and meaning, because inevitably this influences and affects everything around, which is you, your home, your family, your community. And so in the process of Orskong, not only you get a glimpse of what's to come, concerning you, your own person, but also concerning your community. We have to take in mind that the divination process of Orskong in Swedish folk tradition has been recorded since the 1600s and the documentations clearly underline that it is a, a practice older than that. But the surviving written sources concerning Orskong are from the 1600s onwards. So we are talking about people who used to live in small communities concerned with the luck or misfortune of crops, livestock, if this person will be married or not this year, this next new year, who is going to die, love affairs, economic issues, everything that might affect the small community. Because if it affects one, it affects all, still in the sense of being all connected to the small community. The kinsman, the family, and the extensive family, which is the community, the tribe, the clan, <laughs> the mutual help within the community, the exchange of goods among the community. So, of course, it was important to survey uh, the surroundings in, in search for that which might directly affect the small community because the human being, the human beings of the community depend very much on the surroundings and all those creative forces all around including the past members of the community, the ancestors. But still, Orskong can be performed nowadays a little bit harder, surely, and certainly the effects upon the world of the living are different but no less interesting and important and certainly a unique experience. The world changes and so does the journey, the traditions, the mind, the human mind and the experiences but there's always a story to tell and always something new to learn. The more immersed with the wilderness the greater the risk but also the greater the reward. And this specific method is precisely during the end of the year, during winter, because it reflects that old belief when Europeans believed that dark forces and 
supernatural beings uh, were active dur during this season uh, and the dead mingled with the living. So the human being is a lot closer and a lot more receptive to supernatural encounters during winter, which is precisely why one seeks the places where the dead rest or roam. But the entire walk from the starting point of one's domains, the familiar place, and the final destination, which is the places of the dead, there's a lot in between, obviously. It's a symbolic walk towards the other world, passing through obstacles, the unseen forces of the wilds and the lonely places of the world, and a range of supernatural entities trying to lead us astray and prevent us from reaching the final destination, our goal, preventing us from reaching the end of the quest or preventing us from being victorious in the plans we have set for that specific night, that special night. <laughs> it's leaving the familiar and comfortable places behind, passing through the hostile, wild, untamed lands and conquering our fears to reach the places of knowledge and secret wisdom provided by those who live beyond the boundary. In a way, Orsgong is precisely the reenactment of the crossing of boundaries, leaving the world of the living and into the world of the dead, or the other world. A visit to the other side and come back with knowledge, insight, prophecy. This is attested in many mythologies, as you know, and obviously in Old Norse mythology, it's the same. In fact, if you have the time, do watch one of my recent videos concerning uh, water environments and water in general and the afterlife in Old Norse mythology and the representation of the journey through water uh, to reach the other world, water being a clear boundary. Something actually quite noticeable in the archaeological record this reenactment of the journey between worlds and crossing actual physical boundaries in our own world. So, Orsgong ends up being this same religious and spiritual motif of crossing boundaries, crossing clear physical obstacles and difficulties to reach the other world and obtain knowledge and prophecy, to become wiser. But there are many distractions along the way, many supernatural entities, so one must not show any signs of fear or even speak to avoid being distracted and, and, and the purpose is to focus on the main ob objective. It is a solitary experience and if you meet someone else on this yearly walk, maybe even another such as you, doing the exact same thing, the exact same performance or, or practice, no one must talk, the silence is absolute. You are on your own, perceiving the meaning from external activity and not let your senses and emotions get in the way. You must be strong and endure the entire process in exchange for outer Tidor, omens and signs. It can be quite the frightening experience, but then again, you must ask yourself, which is more frightening, the journey or the destination? Do take the time to ponder about this, because this is a divination performance to reveal what's to come next year. So, are you certain you want to know the future? I believe some things should never be revealed. Knowing future events can be a lot more frightening than the, the journey ahead. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes, <laughs> ignorance is a blessing which allows you to keep going forward. Perhaps that's the true lesson here. It's the experiences from the journey that truly count. The world is full of surprises and wonderful possibilities. Let's not be hasty to meet the end. All right, my dear friends, thank you so much for watching. Uh, my apologies for sitting on a chair throughout the entire video but I've been sick and I still have the fever and I feel quite weak and uh, I'm actually in pain, <laughs> but I think I have managed to survive this entire video. Anyway, uh, again, 
Thank you so much for watching. See you on the next video. I hope it was useful, this video. <laughs> and as always, thank you for today.